on behalf of the planning committee, thank you guys for being here to kick off our ninth annual Aspect Graduate Conference and to hear our first plenary speaker, Dr. Sarah Smith. Dr. Smith is an Associate Professor of Geography at UNC Chapel Hill. She is a feminist political geographer interested in the relationship between territory, bodies, and the everyday. In her research, she seeks to understand how politics and geopolitics are constituted or disrupted through intimate acts of love, friendship, and birth. Tonight's talk is titled The Path You Choose Won't Be a Fairy Tale, Urban Prefiguration and, the mountain, and mountain Nostalgia in India's Northwest Himalaya. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Smith. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and for inviting me for this conference. I'm really happy to be here. I also want to say I'm so sorry I'm, I can't stay for the whole event. I wish that I could. Okay, so I'm going to start with a couple stories from field work, and I promise there will be a map, there will be methods, all of that is coming, so don't get too disoriented. I'm going to be talking about Tashi Namgyo, who you can see with um, red colors on his face. Tashi Namgyo is telling us about Varanasi and he's telling us about Mumbai. Yes, yes, there's discrimination, of course. Isn't it everywhere? How is it that Ladakis complain so bitterly about discrimination when they themselves discriminate against Nepalis? And don't you have racism in the US anyway? He's brushing past these ideas and cutting them short. He's not interested in these questions. He wants to tell us how Delhi, Varanasi, and Mumbai have changed him and changed his life. How his father always wanted more for himself but ended up a school teacher. How there's a woman he likes but Tashi can never imagine settling down, getting married, or staying in one place. Taji has been part of a multi-year research project and has documented two years of his life for us. We asked him to show photos of what was most interesting to him, and then he wouldn't stop talking. He was showing thousands of photos. He wants us to watch videos of him dancing. Here's his friends who are drunk. Now he's on a bus. Now he's on a train. Um, to him, everything was interesting. So he starts with this landscape of Ladakh, but then we're in Mumbai. Um, when we look at his pictures, it's, it's similar to a tourist. He's like overwhelmed and he's describing um, the cities in that manner. He's also showing visiting art shows and his own painting. His father doesn't understand his life, but then some, somehow does. So in a workshop, Tashi makes this collage, and what you see is Tashi on the bike with the baseball cap, and then there's his dad when his dad was his age, and there's this red line connecting him to his dad, and then his grandfather is upside down weaving a basket. And he's made this broken line between him and his grandfather to describe for us the ways that he his, feels like his grandfather will never understand his life experience. His father had also like traveled a little bit when he was younger, but then he got married and he had to get a job a few days later, I'm walking and meeting Riggs and Amma. We're both running late, we're like texting, and then we find each other um, in town and start walking together. Riggs and Amma, and you can see her in the kind of silvery gold throwing her um, cap in the air. Riggs and Amma is the kind of person who always looks polished and professional, even when she's wearing jeans and a t-shirt. She's comfortable in her friend's sari, but also in the Laraki Sulma. She, as we walk, she starts telling me everything she's been up to this summer. She's working as a research assistant for an archaeological team. She's also been to the US Embassy. She's working in a nonprofit called Live to Love. She's also done charity work among the Muslim poor in Delhi. By the end of summer, she'll be invited to travel to Bhutan on an all expenses paid trip with this nonprofit. She's worried about the environment, she's thinking about gender issues, and she's also done fun fundraising for heart patients. So Tashi and Riggs and Amo are both exceptional. They're exceptional young people. But by the time I'm in these conversations, I can't even really realize that because all of the young people I've been working with have been so sort of full of surprises. So here's just a collage of some of them. Chusen is the one uh, taking a selfie, and she's the first woman in her village to uh, participate in an archery contest. And then in the middle, you see Namgyal, 
and we'll meet her again later. She shaved her head because she's so irritated with gender norms. Um, up above, there's a feminist flash mob in the Delhi metro, and then on the computer screen in the collage is Tinlis Norbu, who's a devout Buddhist, but really interested in Urdu and Muslim poetry. So this is this cast of characters. My collaborator, who I'll talk about in a little, Mabel and I, we had been concerned, sometimes young people don't want to talk too much about their lives. Um, they're a little shy, or they don't feel themselves to be an expert, even in their own life. But with these folks, once we got them started talking about the urban experience and how it had changed their life, it was as though they couldn't stop talking. Okay, I promised I would tell you what on earth I'm talking about. This, that moment has come. Um, so the students that I just introduced you to are all from Ladakh, which is highlighted up there, um, kind of standing out on the left. Um, so Ladakh is up here in between these two lines of control, one contested border with China and one with Pakistan. In my previous work, there has been about those geopolitics, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. So for this project, I've been working with students from Ladakh, and then Mabel, who's my first PhD student, now an assistant professor at um, Florida State, she's been talking to folks from India's Northeast, so from the other side, and that's gonna come up in a little bit. So you'll see the Northeast on the other side of the map. So these folks are all from, the ones I'm gonna talk about are all from very rural, fairly what you could call remote, regions, but they're going to college in urban Asia, and their life is kind of profoundly influenced by India's com cosmopolitan and complicated urban centers. As rural and marginal migrants, these students intervene in city politics, especially protesting their region's marginalization and racism against Ladakhi, Northeastern, and Tibetan people. But more than that, when they return to their rural spaces, these urban encounters become a foundational part of their own political orientation, and they seek to be differently and live differently back home as urban inflected subjects, but not to recreate urban life. So I ask, how do young college kids look forward to the future as outsiders and aliens in these big Indian cities? as ethnic, linguistic, and religious minorities who've grown up in a remote, high-altitude desert near the Tibetan Plateau. Then they go down to college in lowland India and some of the biggest cities in the world. What happens when you feel like an alien in the country of your birth, especially at the institution that's supposed to welcome you into the nation? That's my big question. So before I go on, I want to, hopefully you're already making these connections, but I want to just um, observe that I'm not thinking of this um, or these questions as only being important for Ladakh, but I think we can all resonate with those just as people who inhabit a college campus where there's folks who are ethnic minorities or from underrepresented groups or first-generation college kids and the different ways they experience our, our urban settings. Um, I also, my overall project on intimate geopolitics argues that love and exclusion, intimacy and expulsion, difference in cosmopolitanism run through our political landscapes. And I have some things I'll come back to that I call demographic fever dreams. So I'll try to highlight in a couple places throughout and then at the end how I think this, uh, these ideas apply beyond uh, the region I'm talking about. Since 2004, my research has focused quite tightly on the geopolitics of love, babies, religion, and politics. And then I've been also thinking about this in relation to race, so how intimate geopolitics are caught up with ideas about race and the future. Um, and in doing this, I've been trying to theorize what I call intimate geopolitics. And I just finished a book with that title. I submitted it Friday, the revision, so some days <laughs> that's coming out. Um, so I argue that intimacy is fundamentally geopolitical, that the intimate relationships between friends, families, and within marriage are entangled in the materiality of territorial struggle. My first research project was inspired by a love story. So I was going out into these fairly small villages and I was ask pe asking people about who they would marry, how many kids they would have, and how they thought about that in relation to territorial struggle, especially in the contested state of Jammu and Kashmir. So while I was doing those interviews, people wouldn't stop talking about their children. And I didn't have a kid, 
<laughs> now I do, and I also bore people talking about my kid all the time. My kid did this today. She read a book in her, you know, classroom. I went there before I drove up here, so I understand. But at that time, I was really struck by this. Like, I'm not asking about your kids, <laughs> but they were telling me all these stories. Um, so what they were telling me was that. They were scraping together funds from here and there, from grandparents, from doing extra work, from digging roads, also that they could send their kids to Delhi to study, or for the poorer families to Jammu to study, which is also in uh, Jammu and Kashmir state. And they were so concerned. They're like, we don't know. Like Maybe they'll get addicted to drugs. Maybe they'll commit suicide because they're so concerned about their exams. Maybe they're sleeping around. They're so concerned and have all these anxieties that they're placing in those children in these distant cities. So the more I heard these stories, the more I really wanted to know, like, what are their kids thinking? So my second project after this one, I turned to these kids. Um, so I've been working on this uh, project for a while now. We did a little bit in 2011, but really it started in about 2015. Um, I have an NSF project, and I've been doing on the one hand, just plain interviews, but also some collaborative um, art projects and longitudinal interviews with the same students over a couple of years, as well as a survey. And a lot of this work has been with Mabel Gierken, who was my first student, and her dad is from Ladakh, and her mom is from Sikkim, so she has family ties in both places, and it's been really fun to work with her on this. You can see the backs of our heads. Her face is going to be later. <laughs> Um, so you see us there at a workshop where we, this is a workshop in 2017, and a lot of the materials you're going to see are from that workshop in terms of the images. So in that workshop, we interviewed students for the second time, and they brought a lot of photographs, and then we made a small, like, handmade zine with them about their experiences. And they also wrote letters, uh, letters to their parents, letters to the rest of India, as they imagined it, and um, letters to future Ladakhi students. To see some of these later. All right. So let's come back just for a minute to Tashi, who I talked about at the beginning. So we could tell this story about Tashi as a beleaguered rural immigrant in a rapidly urbanizing world. He's from this tiny little village known for walnuts. Um, that's uh, it used to have traders who would travel along the Silk Road all the way up to Mongolia, but now those are militarized borders, and you can't travel that way anymore. So we could tell him as this like immigrant from this tiny place. His dad was the first in his family to leave farming for government work. His grandfather, who you saw earlier, still farms barley and makes these baskets from willow twigs. Uh, we could also tell his story as a racialized outsider who goes to Delhi and gets called a Nepali or gets called a racial slur just when he's on the street. And we could tell this about discrimination. Or we might talk about him as one of liberalization's children who's dreaming of freedom and becoming a new liberal subject. But for me, none of these really capture the meaning of urban life for Tashi. I feel like there's all these things that exceed that. So I've tried to um, express some of those in this particular work. So for Tashi, rural to urban migration and the looming pressure to join the workforce, grow up and contribute back to his family, aren't really the central conflict driving how he talks about his life's narrative. Um, instead, he's talking about art, he's talking about how uh, when he was in Delhi, he used to dance with just his foot, but in Varanasi, he could dance with his whole body, um, and he's telling all these other things that exceed that. So parents have sent their young children to these, fam these unfamiliar places with a task, complete your education, make us proud. And this also goes along, of course, with the goals of the Indian state and the overarching developmentalist project of neoliberal, neoliberalism and modernization, in which education and urbanization are passed to become citizen workers and modern subjects. But it's also intensely personal. So this is an excerpt from an interview with the first um, Muslim woman journalist from Ladakh, and she writes, or she, she told me this story about her mother. My mother would always tell us, you have no option, girl, you have to study. She wants to fulfill her dreams through you. And she goes on to talk about how when she used to get up at 3 in the morning to study for exams, a lot of um, college, like getting into college is driven by passing these increasingly difficult exams. 
And her mom, who would be working all day, would get up with her early in the morning, and she would just sit there and be drinking her tea and watching her study. And she would just say, Mom, like, please just go back to bed. But her mom would say, if you know I'm sleeping in this house, you know, you're also going to feel sleepy. So I asked her if she felt that as a burden, and she said no. She said, um, it really motivates you, makes you want to study, because you see your mother struggling to support you. So this was interesting to me because these students who I was talking with, you know, these are the students that I had heard their parents talking about, and their parents are like, who knows what they're up to, they're not thinking about us. But it was touching to see the degree to which they're thinking a lot about their parents, which came out in these letters that they wrote to them, which we later included in the zine. So they wrote that, you know, I'll always be there to help and support you in your old age. Or they would sometimes write these things like, you don't understand me, that's fine, just trust me. Just put trust that you raised me right. So it was very sweet. Um, so from the fringes of the Amazon to the US South to the Himalayas, rural first generation indigenous and racialized minorities seek educational opportunities in urban centers to improve their lives. And while higher education is understood to be a universal good, this temporary migration and uh, the encounters that ensue from it have all kinds of other effects, too. So I'm sure you know this from your own presence on a university campus. Our campus has been kind of fraught with controversy over the Confederate statue, which activists recently pulled down with their own hands. And um, since I have gotten there, we've also like changed the name of our building, which was named for somebody in the KKK. So I see a lot of echoes of this in the way students narrate their, their feelings of belonging or not belonging on our, our own campus. And we actually made a small art project about that too that you can look up at Block Geographies. Okay, so just that's just a shout out to what's happening on our campuses. So what then are the intimate geopolitics of higher education? And how can we account for the many things that happen outside of obtaining that degree itself? So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how these young people theorize the city. And I'm not going to do too much with literature review so that I can focus more on the stories. Um, but I'm drawing on this idea of intimate geopolitics, but also youth and prefigurative politics. So the ways that young people live in the future or live in the present to try to create that future they desire. This could be like activists creating ways to engage in their organizing that they think is more ethical or other kinds of ways as well. I'm also thinking not so much about planetary urbanism, but also about the critiques that have come up in relation to it. So planetary urbanism is this idea that the whole world is now an outcome of urban processes. And there have been some interesting conversations around that, and I especially like the feminist and post-colonial kind of responses to that idea. And then lastly, I'm interested in temporality. So do people picture the future as urban? Because of the way young people are located as those who will you know, live into the future, um, folks put a lot of moral panic and also focus on them. So I call this focus, and some of my writing, I refer to it as generational vertigo, because the folks um, sometimes express it as a kind of dizzying quality where you're looking out at the future with uncertainty, not sure what's to happen, and it creates a lot of political um, events. All right. So here I'm also really interested in how young people theorize the city. So I'm interested in these theories, the city as a site of encounter, as a site where people rethink the rural in relation to the urban, but I'm also interested in how young people describe it as a kind of a character in their life or even as an organ in their body, um, this way that they carry the city with them. So I'll just talk about a few of those. There's actually other ways that this comes up in the research, but I'll focus on these so it's not too chaotic. Um, so first, they see the city as this place where they work out ideas about difference, like who they are in relation to the nation state. Also, as a site of exposure, so a place of, of personal growth and kind of experimentation. And then finally, as a lens to consider the future of their home villages. So they're looking at the city and thinking what they want and don't want. All right.
So if you remember Nam Yal, who had shaved her head, um, this is her mom is on the, the side where they're drinking tea with a thermos. It's her mom in the red scarf. And then on the left, on the other side, I, don't, I never know how this thing that pops. On the right, let's say that, there's um, some kind of urban scenes that uh, young people took pictures of. The experience of the contact zone is overlaid by the often overwhelming experience of the urban environment. Um, young people from small Himalayan villages speak of lights and excitement, but also feeling overwhelmed by city food, like spicy food, the need to haggle, and crowds. Uh, it's actually very reminiscent of how tourists talk about um, Delhi when they first get there. Um, they're like, my stomach hurts, I can't eat such spicy food, etc., etc. They don't try to assimilate which is interesting. Instead, they produce these kind of <coughs> other latitudes and counter topographies that they make for themselves. So they're thinking about themselves in relation to the Indian urban centers, but they don't really try to blend in. Instead, they create these different imaginaries. So they might um, follow, for fashion, follow like K-pop or styles coming out of Japan. They think about themselves in relation to um, East Asia because they are racialized as being East Asian, and they kind of embrace that in a certain way. So they'll say, yeah, I do look Korean, and that's why I'm cutting my hair this way. And they kind of embrace that and create this subculture. Um, so they, many students consciously push the boundaries of what it means to be Indian, or transcend that national imaginary um, altogether. And some of this comes because of this racial exclusion. So these are just some of the phrases from their letters to the dear rest of India. I have a couple quotes related to this experience of difference and exclusion. So Kune says, I never thought that I would be considered like as a this racial slur person. I used to think that humans are humans, yeah. I never liked when I was in lay. I never thought that people are different with their eyes, their looks, their skin colors. I got to know about it when I went outside. And later she she goes on to talk about also the city as like freedom, which is interesting. She wants to walk around at night and all this stuff that I can't get into here, but it's kind of lovely. Um, so she's talking about this experience. And young people do also participate in protests related to this. Um, so you will see on the, the photos here are from a protest where Ladakhi students dressed up as aliens. And they said India was treating them like an alien, so then they dressed up as aliens um, and shut down the city roads. So in this, they also relate to students from the Northeast. So the Northeast is, you know, hundreds of miles away from them, but folks get racialized in a similar way. So Ladakhis are often asked if they're from Manipur or asked if they're from Sikkim, asked if they're from the Northeast. And then in some ways, they also perform solidarity. So there was a hate crime and this young man Irotanya was killed in 2014, and a lot of Larakis also took to the streets to protest his death. So they come to develop this sense of solidarity that Mabel and I are thinking about um, in some papers we're working on now. Um, oh, I included quite a bit of slides on this one topic. Okay, I'm going to actually skip this one. This one I talked about a little bit. This is from this protest. So what's interesting about that is the city becomes this place where you think about difference and then you take that thinking back home and you see your home in a different way. So this was in a group discussion. This one student says, we were in the minority, I was the only Laraki, and they were like, some people call us the slur, they call us that name. We don't feel good when someone calls us by a different name, we have our own personal name. And then the second student sort of interrupted her and he said, there's that same thing here too, you know. I think, you know, anywhere you go, majority try to rule over the minority. For instance, here, we might have called Bihari or Nepali to those guys, you know. So he's referring to migrant laborers that come from elsewhere in South Asia and build the roads up in Ladakh um, for less pay. So it's the same thing, I guess. But the thing is, it's all about opening up to everyone. And then you get to know who's good, who's bad. And the same thing here, too, in Ladakh, you know. So it's interesting, so, and he goes on to say, meeting with not going to always be meeting good friends. There are shitty people here, too. So it's interesting how on several occasions when folks would talk about discrimination, he would bring it back home 
and he would talk about how his experience in the city then made him think differently about how he had treated outsiders back home. So we saw that come up in interviews in a way that folks are reflecting back on that urban experience and then they want to live differently back home. So people, uh, students also use this word exposure and they even use this a lot of these interviews I conducted in English, um, but I also do interviews in Ladakhi. And this is a word that people will use even in Ladakhi. It's like you're speaking in Ladakhi and then you just throw in that English word exposure. So people talk about the city as this exposure, this place where you get a different kind of experience and experience with diversity and so on. And they talk about that in relation to how the city transforms them as a person. Um, even sometimes experience of discrimination, but I won't go back into that here. Um, so you see here students participating in societies, doing charity work, and so on. Um, this comes after kind of a period of adjustment. So when they first get to the city, there's this time when they need to adjust. Um, often, like I said, people talk about that just in terms of the physical appearance of the city and also even the temperature. So uh, one student said, like, it was so hot, even my hands felt hot. I, I couldn't cool them down because Ladakh is... 11,000 feet above um, sea level, it's nice and cool all the time. So Dolma says, first time, the very first time outside Ladakh, I was like, it's so shiny, everyone was so clean. What is this? Why is everyone so clean? But then she goes on to say that it was so hot, it was unbearable, and it took her a year to adjust. And actually, that was pretty consistent. Folks talk about a year where they can't really get much done. They get sick, they're just adjusting, trying to figure out how college works if they need tutoring and so on. But after that, they start to take on new roles and think about their own lives in a kind of different way. So partly that's meeting folks from across India and kind of celebrating cultural diversity in a way, and also um, doing service work, which folks talked about quite a lot. And I see that as one way that they're trying to think about the way they're positioned in relation to the Indian state as um, they Ladakhis fall into a scheduled tribe category, so they're a recognized indigenous group, and they're seen as being quote-unquote backward in the terminology of the Constitution. Um, but then here they also perform like service and charity and helping the poor, which allows them to flip that script around a little bit. And those are some of the images that they put together on that topic, on topic of service and um, so on. So there's, there's this discrimination, there's this sense of service and like becoming a good person. And then there's also just pleasure, fun, leisure. And this came out in so many folks' um, interviews. Here is Namgyal and she's talking about, like she would send me a lot of selfies and she's like experimenting with her personal style and dressing in ways she doesn't feel like she can back home and just enjoys it. And she also talked about this in relation to larger feminist projects in India. So there's just some images here from um, urban feminist projects in India and also Pakistan, Girls at Dalit is um, Pakistani, um, which are places where young women in, in India and Pakistan are trying to claim urban spaces just for pleasure. So one of the things I think is um, really interesting about these projects is they're not claiming space for you know, I need to be able to get to work safely, but they're like, I want to just walk around at night. Or I want to just sleep in the park. So there's one called Meet to Sleep, and they just organize a date and time, and they just nap in parks together. Um, it's, it's a good one. Um, okay, so these, um, like Namgyal, for instance, she's also inspired by this kind of um, feminist movement, which kind of she takes back to Iraq. So there's a way that there's this movement between back home and the city and folks are working out their identity in relation to that. And I really like the conversations I had with um, Fatima about this. So Fatima told me these stories in relation to whether she would wear a headscarf or she wouldn't have wear a headscarf. And she was like laughing through this whole time she's talking about it. Because she, what she told me was that when she was in Delhi, she would just feel comfortable in jeans and a t-shirt. Then she would go back home to Ladakh and she would just wear a totally different outfit. She would wear solar kameez and she would cover her head. And then she was just like, this is who I am in Ladakh and this is who I am in Delhi. And I was like, so is this like a secret identity? Did your parents know? And she's like, oh no, they knew. They knew, like people knew. It's just, this is just how I felt. So 
she said, sometimes I used to wonder. I'm so open and free here in Delhi. I wear whatever I want to wear. So what exactly is my identity? I don't know what I am inside and what things I follow and what principles I have in everything. And there's this thing of outside identity. And I used to have this conflict and think, I should just go home and tell everybody. So then I asked like, if it felt like a secret identity. And then she went on to say, I asked her, like, you know, like, when wearing the headscarf, isn't it really meant to be deeper than you're just kind of like playing around like this? And she was like, yeah, I was just waiting for that. I was waiting to have that feeling that this is kind of coming from inside me. And she asked her parents, and her parents are like, whatever. Like, you're going to figure this out. It's fine. Just, you know, you'll, you're going to know who you are at some point. And then she told me that she had this time when she was sick, and she stayed home, and she really thought about this and kind of made this whole plan about what she would wear, that she would wear the same thing in both places, and kind of reconciled herself to it. OK. So the last thing, in closing, I'll think through a little bit how folks are thinking about who the city allows them to be, and also what they want to take back home. And I have this little anecdote that um, doesn't relate so much to mobility, but I think it's more interesting in relation to time. So there's this, you see these two pictures um, that are pinned up on a bulletin board. And this is from a project that I did in 2011. And Young people went out into the city with digital cameras, and they were supposed to take pictures of the past, the present, and the future. And then we were looking at them all in the laptop, and they were kind of telling what they meant. So this kid stands in. He shows this picture of himself and this picture of this um, memole. So we would call somebody in this age bracket like a grandpa or memole. So he shows these pictures, and all the kids are like, oh, you're the future. And memole is in the past. And he was like, no, like, what are you talking about? Like, this is me today, and then I'm going to be just like Memele in the future. Memele is my future. And it was such an interesting moment because nobody else had interpreted that. They had interpreted it as he's kind of on this different trajectory. But then there's a way that these young folks and how they talk about their lives, they want to keep something. They have this nostalgia and this love for their place as it is and these concerns about cities like Delhi. And they're trying to decide what they want in relation to these places. Um, so I often think about his story in relation to these college kids that I'm talking to now. So young people, the young people I work with, they're a little bit cynical about politics. They just use that as a term, like it's all politics. But then in some ways, in the ways they're living their life, they're very political. So they're trying to think about how they want to be together, where they want to live, what kind of citizen they want to be. So a good example is Gide. So Gide tells me, I would love to go outside, roam around the world, but then home is home. Today in Ladakh, there's a lot of kids who also need help. Um, and she goes on to say, like, wherever you would go, like, what would the point of any of this be if you didn't come back and serve your own, your own people? So young people seek to, and they often have faith that they can create a new world through selective deployment of their own region's cultural practices, but then they also want to bring some things with them. So they want to experiment with gender identity. They have, many of them brought up like LGBTQ acceptance, gay marriage, so these kind of questions that they had encountered more in the urban or through like global media, but that weren't talked about so much in their parents' generation. So they're thinking about how can they bring these different political sensibilities and relations to one another, also relations between religious groups. How can they transform those back home? So some broader comments from that is that um, I understand young people to be understood by themselves and others as a sort of geopolitical border or a vector from past to future through which people are trying to manage future territories and future politics. So this renders them vulnerable and symbolic of demographic change and also means that the parent-child or caretaker child relationship can be and has been targeted to erase people, languages, histories, and to um, and also to protect um, uh, anti-black and anti-brown and anti-indigenous violence in the future generations. So I think that there's a way we can see the kind of different manifestations of white supremacy today as a kind of concern about the future that often comes to bear on young people, on, for instance, the 
family separations at the border, or other kinds of politics that are coming up in different settings today. I also think that this ties to the borders of childhood, um, meaning who gets to be a child is geopolitical, which we're really familiar with um, this year in terms of whose children are getting protected and aren't. Um, in other cases for the Himalayan students I work with, mountains become a kind of internal border. And of course here we have similar examples where for them by crossing the mountains, you've almost crossed a kind of ethnic and racial border that you then experience in embodied ways. And at the same time, even when there's these geopolitical elements, young people also take up and play with um, the ways that their lives and subjectivities are bordered and use kind of politics of fun and even frivolity to tell their own life story. So I think we do them a disservice um, when we ignore that. Um, all right, so that's most of what I have. The last thing I'm gonna do is just tell how you pick up some of these ideas in different work outside the book. So I've also been thinking about some of this in relation to the intimate geopolitics of higher education right here in the US. So I, I have one paper um, out about that that's thinking about the university as a cosmopolitan site that also erases its pre-existing forms of cosmopolitanism. Um, so that's about how, for instance, most of the um, housekeeping staff at my university are actually um, refugees from Burma. And we don't see them because they clean at night. They, they are there because the uh, black workers previously organized for better working conditions, and this was the solution. So we're trying to understand how universities both position themselves as places where you learn to be cosmopolitan, but then they erase different kinds of cosmopolitanism. Um, and I, I also work with a feminist collective, and we've done some stuff about racial justice. Um, so I also just uh, wrote with my colleagues a paper for signs on demographic fever games. So here we're trying to think about this relationship between bodies and territory in relation to masculinity and how the future gets imagined through demographic change. So we talk about kind of the Trump election and the way there were these you know, stories that are not only racist, but also weird. Um, so we focus really on like, why the weirdness and what is the weirdness doing. So for instance, the taco trucks is a good example this idea of that as like a, a fearful thing, or this, just the ways that the future gets talked about in kind of absurd ways, but then the absurdity doesn't mean they don't do the work. Um, and also, there's a, a separate side of this, of trying to think about this in relation to the Anthropocene. Because I'm thinking about the future in relation to young people, but also like climate change, and also um, the ways that people work out their fears around the future in popular culture. So that I work on with Mabel, but also my other first student, Pavitra. Okay, so that's all I have for you. I just um, want to say thanks so much to all of you for listening, and of course I always like to thank these students who have been so lovely in sharing their lives with me.